Uh, good afternoon, I'm Bob Wells, a, a board member of the Vermont Humanities Council. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this talk by Professor Joel Mokier. Joel is the Robert H. Strohs Professor of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Economics and History at Northwestern University and a Sackler Professor at the Aitan Berglas School of Economics at the University of Tel Aviv. Joel is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the British Academy, and the Dutch Royal Academy. He has been the president of Economic History Association, editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Economic History, and a co-editor of the Journal of Economic History. In 2006, he won the biennial Heineken Award for History, offered by the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences, and in 2015, the Balzan International Prize for Economic History. Author of countless articles and books in his field, his most recent book, A Culture of Growth, The Origins of the Modern Economy, was published in 2016 by the Princeton University Press. He specializes in economic history and the economics of technological change and population change. Later this evening, right here in this room, Professor Mokier and his colleague at Northwestern, Robert Gordon, will discuss their differing outlooks of technological progress and economic prosperity. Professor Mokier will take questions at the conclusion of his talk. And just as a courtesy, I would ask all of you if you have cell phones please be sure they're either turned off or muted or put on airplane mode, whatever the most effective way to make sure they don't interrupt the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Joel Mokier. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I'm kind of fortunate because my learned colleague, Bob Gordon, isn't here yet, so I get a chance to go before him and I'll you know, convince you that I'm right, he's wrong, and then maybe tonight at the debate, you'll already have made up your minds. Uh, but as actually, the truth, of course, is that, you know, we're both economists, and we actually live about uh, 15 feet from each other on the corridor of the uh, economics department at Northwestern, and we actually agree on 90% of all things. It's the other 10% we always talk about, right? But that's where the fun is. But basically, what we agree about is that the reason that the world as a whole today is so much richer than it was, say, 200 years ago, is primarily because we know more. That is to say, we have better technology. I'm not saying that we're smarter, because we may not be. But knowing and being smarter aren't quite the same thing. And so we agree on that. Where we disagree is whether this can continue or not. And so I'm going to give you my viewpoint in some detail this afternoon. And tonight you'll hear Bob's and you'll see my, my uh, response to that. But basically, I think it's fair to say, and there you have a copy of Bob's book. I mean, I'm giving him some free publicity here. But basically, the argument that he's making, and there are others who agree with him, uh, is that essentially the best is over. Um, I know he's not actually making the old cliche that everything that can be in invented has been invented. I don't think anybody ever actually said this. It's mostly apocryphal. But, you know, the term has been used that the low-hanging fruits have been picked, the ones that make us better off. And that's what his book is, is basically arguing, right? So future inventions will not be as radical as things like electricity or antibiotics uh, that have made our life uh, so much better. And so what the argument then is, is the outlook for the American economy, and if you want the world economy in a bigger sense, uh, it's kind of bleak. Uh, there's all kind of headwinds blowing against us. That's you know, the term he uses. And because technology isn't going to be strong enough, it, it's going to happen. To, uh, progress will happen, but it's not going to be strong enough. So actually economic growth will, drown, will slow down to a trickle and sort of the best, the best is over. Now, there are another kind of techno-pessimists who argue the exactly 
opposite. I mean, if you read the writings, and here I'm, I'm showing some name of you people who, who have a very different point of view, people like, say, Jeremy Rifkin, who's an economist, or Ray Kurzweil, who's a, a, a computer scientist, and Yuval Harari is a historian. But they all predict in some way that technological change is going to be so fast and so dramatic and so radical that some kind of technological dystopia is what we can actually expect because machines, robots, you know, artificial intelligence will take over everything. And uh, because they're so much smarter than people are, uh, they may, you know, depending on who you read, chase us off the planet, uh, annihilate us, enslave us, or turn us into these sort of drones that you see in this movie, Wally, -E, you know, these sort of fat people in, in this amusement park. So there's two kinds of technological pessimists and sort of, and my take on it is, you know, the good news is they can't both be right. And the even better news is they can both be wrong, and I think they are, and I'm going to try to convince you of that fact. Now, before I go on, I, I want to say this, this sort of pessimism about the past isn't new. So here's a quote from a very famous historian, maybe the, the embodiment of what is known as Whig history in, in Britain, Thomas Babington McCurley. And here's what he says, and this is sort of worth perhaps uh, reading aloud. He says, in every age, everybody knows that up to his own time, progressive improvement has been taking place. Nobody seems to reckon on any improvement in the next generation. Now, ah, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, on what principle is it that there's nothing but improvement behind us? We are to expect nothing but deterioration before us. Now, the date in which he wrote this, 1830, is kind of telling because that's the date in which the first trains were running in Great Britain. And as we all know, within 10, 20, 30 years, trains were running everywhere uh, in the Western world. And now he had probably no good way of knowing this in 1830. Certainly, I couldn't say how, how railroads would explode as, a, as a, you know, an element in, in economic growth. But it's sort of telling that he was saying this exactly at that, at that point in time. And I think in each generation, we have these sort of doomsayers who claim that uh, the best is behind us. So my bottom line on the future is very simple. And it's, you ain't seen nothing yet. And uh, the best is still to come. And then I added, last night, this little caveat, which is, if we don't screw up. And I will talk a little bit about the end, in which I will moderate my optimistic view a little bit. But I first want to kind of give you a flavor of why I am, at least in this regard, rather optimistic. And what I'm going to do is, yeah, I can be sure, because this is about looking at the future. And we all know how good economists have been in the past at looking at the future. I mean, they've always, you know, what is they always predict that, you know, 17 out of the next, out of the last 11 recessions. Uh, but uh, we, I can't be sure. And, but I, I do, but, what, but that's, I'm not going to actually give you exact predictions. What I'm going to do is look at the past, which is really my, sort of my, my job. I'm, I'm, kind of an, I'm an economic historian. And I'm going to try to extract from past experience the main factors that I think led to technological progress. I'm not going to be able to give you the whole list of it, because the, the list is long, and I picked a few. But if there are questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And I'm basically looking for these patterns. And then I'm going to ask myself, do these patterns hold today? in the world today. And if they do, and if these mechanisms are not uh, all that violently different, then yes, then there's a good reason to believe that technology, technological change will continue. So I'm, before I put it on, I, I do give you this, this site from a physicist, of two, you know, won the Turing Prize, and a very famous physicist in England and Cambridge, David Deutsch. And he has a line that says, everything that is not forbidden by the laws of nature is achievable, given the right knowledge. Now, as an economist, I guess one would add, well, given enough knowledge, of course, and also given the right incentives, given enough time, and given plenty of resources. And that's something to, obviously, to think about. But in principle, I think he's, he's right. I mean, there is, if, if we, uh, there is really no ceiling on what the technological achievement that we can expect in the future. So the main point. I want to drive down home uh, this afternoon is something like this. We think about technology 
as basically the way we make things, right? I mean, the way, the way we produce. And it's not just manufacturers, it's services, it's, you know, it's, it's going to the doctor, it's, 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 it's driving a car, it's everything. But we know things, and that allows us uh, to use technology. But underlying this technology is some kind of understanding we have of the laws and regularities and phenomena in nature, which we call science. And uh, what I would like to point out is, and this is something that probably uh, most, most of you have already realized, it isn't just quite right that science drives technology, that we first develop, say, I don't know what, uh, nuclear physics, and then we build a nuclear reactor, or we first understand the laws of electricity and then we, electricity, and then we build a reactor. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's, it's, it's really a two-way street. But what I want to sort of stress here, that behind technology is what we know in science, and even if it's true, as Gordon says, that the low-hanging fruits of technology, <coughs> of technology have already been picked and the easy things have been invented, Science allows us to build taller and taller ladders. And so this tree is infinitely tall, and we can pick all, all the one. And um, the particular connection between technology and science that I want to think about this afternoon is what is sometimes known, and this is kind of a, a bit of an awkward term, but I didn't invent it. It's called artificial revelation. It was uh, proposed in, in, in three decades ago by a very famous historian of, of science at Yale, uh, Derek de Sola Price. And basically what he points out is that our nature did not uh, mean our senses to see certain things. And we fool it, you know? So, you know, microscopes, an example, right? I mean, nature doesn't want us to see bacteria because our eyes won't see it, but we build a tool that allows us to see it. Same is true for, you know, all kind of other things that you can imagine. And it's not just observing things, it's, for instance, also computing things, right? Nature allows us to compute things. Our minds can compute things at a certain speed. And with the right equipment, we can do this about, you know, a trillion times faster. So we fool nature in that way. And by doing so, of course, we can enhance uh, our knowledge. And so if you think about that, what you realize is technological progress stimulates discoveries that then allow further innovation. And in that regard, technology pulls itself up by the bootstraps through its impact on, uh, on scientific understanding. And that's what's happening today, but it didn't start today. Okay, so here you have two tools that drove the so-called scientific revolution in Europe of the late 17th century. And this is a, uh, a modern reconstruction of Galileo's telescope. Famously, of course, Galileo in 1609 took a telescope and looked at the sky and saw the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, and voila, a new age in science had started. Um, this is uh, Robert Hooke's microscope. He was not the inventor of the microscope, neither was Galileo the inventor of the telescope, but Hooke's was is the first, to, or one of the first, to actually sit down and take a microscope to actually examine what it is that one could see about living beings using this uh, magnificent tool. Here's a slightly a different tool, but also one uh, worth, keep, worth thinking about. This is an air pump. This is Robert Boyles, who was, of course, Pook's employer in England. And uh, this is an air pump in which they basically did what an air pump is supposed to do. They created a vacuum. Now, <laughs> this is no minor things, ladies and gentlemen, because, of course, Aristotle had taught that a vacuum is impossible. Nature abhors a vacuum. And voila, I am making a vacuum. And, you know, this nice 17th century uh, uh, Brits. They did things that you couldn't get away with today, but they would put a cat in a container and suck out all the air, and then look at the cat sort of slowly dying. They say, aha, aren't we smart? You know, you couldn't do that today, my, not at my university at least, but that was the 17th century. But of course, it's not just killing cats that matters. <laughs> it's actually creating a vacuum. And a vacuum, as many of you surely know, is the fundamental element of the first atmospheric engines that were built at the beginning of the 18th century, which is the first time people were able to convert, essentially, heat energy into motion using something which we would call an engine. Okay, and that's still, of course, very much with This is the first time this is actually happening, and it rested on, this, on the insight 
that you can create the vacuum. It's not the only insight. I can talk more about it if you want to. But that give, gives a kind of idea how that works. So this is all in the 17th century. What about our own time? Well, here's the 20th century, and I just pick this, 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 this example, I could pick many. This is one tool that technology places at the disposal of science to understand the world better. It's called X-ray crystallography. Now, X-ray crystallography, the technique that it provides has led to at least 20 Nobel Prizes, okay? So this is the guy who developed the theory, Max von Laue, a German, and this is the man who built the sort of first spectrometer, uh, William Henry Bragg. I really like him because if you look carefully at him, you'll see he bears an uncanny resemblance to John Cleese. <laughs> but it's not, it's, but, this is, but this is an earlier picture. Um, but, you know, X-ray crystallography, and the, of course the great breakthrough that X-ray crystallography that everybody should know is, of course, Rosalind Franklin's 1953 use of crystal spectro spectro spectroscopy to help discover the structure of the DNA, for which her two male co-authors got the Nobel Prize, <laughs> and she got nothing but, you know, that was 1953. Uh, but this is clearly, this is the famous picture that she took uh, 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 that led to the uh, understanding of the structure of uh, the DNA molecule. And uh, so what about today? So this is all history, some recent, some old. So what about today? Well, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Galileo never had this. This is a, an extremely uh, large telescope deploying lasers for adaptive optics, okay? So this is what it, it, it really looks like. Oh, this is an artist's impression. But this is what it does. So you have two photographs of the planet Uranus, one made with a regular telescope, and one made with one that's called adaptive optics, which corrects the pictures about 10,000 times a second. And you can sort of see the difference in sharpness and uh, accuracy of what this new tool does. Is that not good enough for you? you know, here's the mother of all telescopes. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. It's not out yet. It's planned for October 2018. But it will, by all accounts, um, revolutionize astronomy at least as much as adaptive teles telescopy and the Hubble telescope and everything we've had until, until now. Okay. So here is something that, you know, this is a microscope that Louis Pasteur would never have dreamed about, okay? This is the Betzig Hell type of stimulated emissions depletion uh, microscope, which is basically uh, uh, leads us to look into what is now known as the nano uh, dimension. And in fact, microscopes, interestingly enough, much like telescopes, is, is a technique that keeps evolving, even so it is now uh, 400 years old. Uh, and here's maybe an illustration of this. These are usually Nobel Prizes are not given for inventions, right? They're given for discoveries. They're, but for microscopy, they make an exception. Here's a whole list. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, you can sort of take a look about all the Nobel Prizes that he have been given to people for improving microscopy. The last one was this year. Uh, which is for uh, Jacques Duboucher, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson for using uh, cry what's known as cryomicroscopy. I'm not going to go into the detail, but it has to do with, you know, basically looking at um, uh, uh, biological molecules uh, after you are able to, to freeze them. So this is still ongoing. We're making these tools better and better, and with them, of course, the science improves. But these are all techniques that have gotten better. We have things that just didn't, nothing like that existed at all in the past. And one of the most underrated breakthroughs of that is actually lasers. So, you know, lasers are maybe one of the most powerful tools that humans have ever designed. That 50 years ago, nobody even, even dreamed about it. This is a picture of a, of a, uh, a quantum cascade laser at my university. This is a stone throw away from my, from my office. I thought it was kind of cute to put it up there. Uh, but you know, when, the, when lasers were first uh, developed, one of its inventors, I say he, its inventor here, but in fact, it has five or six inventors, but uh, Mayman is one of the sort of people who most widely credited for it. And he said in 1960 uh, that lasers were a solution in search of a problem. So, you know, what we, of course, we all use lasers in our uh, 
daily life in barcode readers, in medicine, in entertainment, playing music, you know, watching videos, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, it may, in, in there it may well have reached some kind of uh, saturation point. But what we don't realize, I think, enough is how much the use of lasers has changed the way people do science. Uh, it's become truly indispensable. So here's a long list of things <laughs> that we can do with lasers. Again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, you know, it go, ranges all the way from uh, biochemistry and uh, uh, essentially geology uh, to this, where which, which too won a Nobel Prize this year. This is the detection of or I should, I should say, the establishment, the empirical establishment of gravitational waves, which were postulated by Einstein uh, famously uh, 100 years ago and only now could be established to be true thanks to lasers. And of course, that sort of used to be the holy grail of physics. Of course, the holiest of all holy grails in physics is nuclear uh, fusion, uh, which we're still waiting for, you know, 60 years later. But... Um, Presumably, if we're going to do it, it will be thanks to uh, this new tool that's become available. And then, of course, and this is the most obvious and the most uh, uh, widely uh, is high-powered computing. And so we now have available to us the kind of computing power that couldn't even have been imagined 20 years ago. In my little smartphone, I have more computing power than everything that was available uh, uh, to NASA in 1969 when they put the first person in the moon. And so does everybody else in this room. Uh, we have just developed these Im incredibly powerful tools, but what these tools do is they not only make our life comfortable and convenient, but they help scientists do better, more, and new science. And uh, so there's different ways in which they do so, and I'm just going to give you an example. But, but you know, when I teach this stuff to my students, and they actually, many, many of them are in the sciences and they're taking a course in economics because they have a distal requirement, you know, not because they're interested. But, <laughs> but you know, I talk about this stuff and say, hey, you know, Professor, how did anybody ever do any research before they had computers? You know, I mean, we can't imagine what our life would be like. And so what it does is basically, it's first, it allows us to store and search and analyze unimaginably large databases. Okay? And we used to have big data. Forget big data. You know, we now have mega data. You know, we now no longer deal in terabytes. We have brontobytes. God knows what they are. And, and, and so, and these, so there's a whole field now, I'll talk about this in a second, uh, called uh, data science. But computers can do something else which if you don't sort of deep, dig a little bit deeper into the science, you don't fully realize. Much of science consists of writing down relationships that we can solve. Uh, so there's, we can write down equations describing certain physical processes, you know, at the subatomic level, quantum level, turbulence. So we can write up the, the differential equations, but they're not open, they don't have open solutions. So the only thing you can do you simulate them. Well, how do you simulate them? Well, you simulate them with computers. Well, until 10 years ago, this was going nowhere because these computers just weren't powerful enough. And now they're getting to be powerful enough. And so we actually have entirely new fields, ladies and gentlemen, called computational chemistry. Google it. You know, <laughs> it's not being going to be very easy to read, but it's, you know, it's impressive. There are thousands and thousands that hit you again. Computational biology. So here's computational physics, and I just clipped this off the internet. And basically, it, it, what it allows you to do is the kind of physics that nobody could ever have dreamed about uh, uh, even 50 years ago. Um, and just what, as, as, as I said, you know, you can study electronic structure, you can study nuclear dynamics, uh, fusion, climate dynamics, uh, relative, relativistic astrophysics, don't ask. And um, we, they can do all this not simply because they, the mathematics can't be solved, but it can be simulated. And um, we're on the verge of a new breakthrough here because, as uh, you probably all know, we're sort of 
we are on the verge of breakthrough in what's known as quantum computing. Now, we've been on that verge 35 years, so I don't hold your breath. But if they, if they crack, this kind of work will be vastly accelerated. It may not actually help you, you know, play, you, uh, play uh, computer games, but for this kind of work, that will be an extremely important thing. And then, as I said, you know, we have something called data science. Again, this is something on which progress has come in leaps and bounds. Um, but the last, I think, 10 years have been very exciting and, 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 uh, and uh, very interesting. And uh, so I'm quoting here uh, one of these famous data guys. This is a man called Jim Gray, uh, who was at Berkeley for many years. And uh, he basically argued, and this is a direct quote, he basically thinks data science as a sort of a fourth paradigm of science. So we have empirical, we have theoretical, we have computational, and now data-driven science. And basically, as, uh, this is a direct quote, everything about science is changing because the impact of information technology and the data delusion that came with it. Now, mind you, this was written in 2007 because he died, or so it is believed, he disappeared on his, on, on his boat, um, in 2007. And that's before the big breakthrough with data science, which is essentially artificial neural networks that was only developed in the last five or six years, mostly in Canada, by the way, uh, which allow us to uh, do what we now talk about more and more, which is artificial intelligence. Now, what, and, and yet there's no way you could have done that without computing. And what, <laughs> and what this allows you to do, essentially, and this is another quote, it allows you to detect uh, uh, regularities and correlations that are detected, even if they are so, and this is a quote, so twisty that the human brain can neither recall nor uh, predict them. So, you know, this is obviously, not all science should be like that, obviously, because this is all about looking for patterns and looking for regularities and uh, looking for correlations, not so much actually understanding what's going on, okay? So, you know, but, but, but still, this is clearly giving us a good way of solving uh, problems, looking for regularities, and then try to build models that explain them. Having said that, I want to impress upon you that you know, it's more than just digital. The digital world, whether it's artificial intelligence, or robotics, or self-driving cars, or computers, blah, 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 it's a very important part of it, but it isn't everything. There are ex things that are so exciting in fields that have nothing to do with digital that I think the word revolution again comes to mind. Uh, Freeman Dyson, in the first page of his second page of his book, he says, if the 20th century was the century of physics, the 21st century will be the century of biology. And uh, I don't know about that, but... <laughs> but um, there are things that are happening in biology that we could have never dreamed about. And the most, clearly the most exciting and also the most scary thing is what's known as, as uh, gene editing techniques. Okay? This is not the genetic engineering you know, of the 1970s and 1980s. This is something entirely different. This is the so-called uh, CRISPR-Cas9 techniques in which you know, they get you know, viruses to change the way bacteria has produced their genes. And there's now already a new generation called uh, base editing. And essentially what this will allow us to do is to rewrite DNA. Not just take a little piece of DNA from one animal, put it in another, but actually go to one animal and say, this is, used to be your DNA, and now it's something else. And uh, now that is playing God with a capital G, ladies and gentlemen. Now, don't, don't, don't. I know people, people have reservations about this, but quite frankly, we've always played God. You know, God did not create poodles. We did. <laughs> it's just that we're getting better at playing God. Uh, that is what technology is really basically about. So we're doing other things which I can talk about if you have any questions. And one of the exciting things is self-reproductions of proteins. That's actually kind of important because most of the proteins that we produce, I mean, when I say most, all the proteins that we produce, we produce from animals, right? So you want to have your steak tonight? That steak once was an animal. You want you know, your, your, your eggs, whatever. All these things are produced by animals, which 
we've been doing since the beginning of history, except it turns out that animals are a source of pollution in, in many ways, not just that they create uh, 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 that they create hothouse gases, but you know they do all they pollute things in, in many other ways. So if we can circumvent cows and make steaks directly in the lab, you know that if, if, particularly if they taste exactly the same, this would not be uh, uh, such a bad idea. Well, also there's other areas in which progress has been incredibly exciting. Material science is perhaps one of them. That's of course where these big powerful microscopes come in. And uh, so across the board, I would say, we are looking now at a world um, in which techniques are so revolutionary that their intended and their unintended consequences scare a lot of people, and they perhaps should. But on the other hand, uh, as I am going to argue with you, there is no way of stopping it. Oops, sorry. So what does all this mean? So the, the logical point I want to make is where Gordon and his fellow doomsters get it wrong is that they look, they look at computers and they look at lasers and, and they look at the effect on productivity. So how good are these things in the, their application to technology? But their main effect may not be directly on productivity. Their main effect will be on the science and that the science then in some other way affects the productivity, maybe in a totally unrelated area. But this sort of... Uh, give and take between science and technology is going on and has been going on, as I argued, for, for centuries. And in fact, it may be more powerful than the former. All right. So I think that point is, I've driven that point to the ground. And I want to say something, talk about a few other things that lead me to this sort of optimistic view of the future. So one of them is the importance of institutions. Or institutions is basically the way economists now talk about things that are not technological but have to do with the rules of the game, whether they're political or legal or whatever. And so tools, no matter how powerful, are not enough uh, to explain technological progress. It really thrives best in certain economic and political circumstances. And so I'm going to give you just a few tidbits on this, but books, you know, volumes have been written about this. I have myself a and so, of the many things that I could raise here, there are two things that matters most, and they clearly betray my training in my life as an economist, okay? The first is that the system needs to incentivize and reward scientific and intellectual innovators. And of course, it's also important that they don't th threaten them for challenging the conventional wisdom which has certainly in the past has happened. You know, we mentioned Galileo. You all know Galileo was held before the Inquisition uh, because of his belief in, in a heliocentric uh, universe. And that kind of thing clearly doesn't help. Uh, but the problem isn't that so much that. The problem really is that producing knowledge, being an intellectual innovator, is under-incentivized, as we say. Why? Because you can't own knowledge, right? You can't possess it. It's not an asset that I can make money from because once I have a piece of knowledge, you know, I've just proved some kind of theorem. Once I tell somebody about it, there's no way I can stop the person from telling the rest of the world, and so I can't exclude people from using it, which is the idea about owning anything, right? <laughs> And so this has been, of course, known for, for a long time, and we have all kinds of sort of half-assed solutions about that, like the patent system, for instance. Uh, but it is a major, a major problem, and we need to incentivize people who create knowledge. The other thing that I think is critical, and this too betrays my background as an economist, is we need a competitive and free market for ideas in which... And by competitive, an economist basically means fragmented. There are many participants. There are no monopoly. Okay? In medieval Europe, for instance, the Christian church had a monopoly on knowledge. That's typically not a healthy thing, and it's perhaps not surprising that the scientific revolution occurred after that monopoly was broken by the Reformation. Um, but what more equally important, I think, is that we, what we want is that the most creative persons, the inter people think outside the box, the innovators, the heretics, if you want, that they can basically move around and locate wherever they want. That's, I think, a necessary ingredient uh, 
of a free marketing ideas. Okay, so you know, just to take you a little bit back again, these two conditions were met to an ever increasing extent in early uh, modern Western Europe after or at about the time of the Reformation. I mean, I would sort of put it put this in about uh, 1500, and from that period on, you see ever accelerating. Uh, intellectual innovations into the Age of Enlightenment, which is the 18th century. And by that time, you know, th this is the system that gives us people like James Watt and Adam Smith and Lavoisier and Euler and Alessandro Volta and Beethoven, if you want. These are all great innovators. But basically what made them innovate is that there were ways in which they were rewarded and that they could move about if they wanted. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them did. So if you, if you ask, look at this system for today, what does it look like? Well, you know, it's <laughs> sort of customary the last year, I think, and I'm one of them, to sit here and kvetch about how, you know, the modern world is getting, is getting awful. But the truth is, if you think about it, that t the world today still proves unprecedented incentives to successful intellectual innovators. And I'm not just talking about in inventors, people actually patenting, I'm talking about scientists, I'm talking about mathematicians, I'm talking people doing medical research, research in the humanities, research in the social sciences, people basically who come up with novel ideas. And so what kind of incentives do we offer? Well, we all know what they are, okay? We give them what they want more than anything else, which is financial security and a chance to do their work under, you know, being undisturbed, okay? So we give people financial security, which is what we do when we give people tenure in universities or in research institutes. We give them, if they need so, research accounts or NSF grants or whatever. And then we give them, you know, we pet their egos. Uh, academics have egos, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, and we give them named and endowed chairs. And we give them various prizes all the way down from the Nobel to, you know, the Fields Medal to the Balzan Prize, the Lasker Prize, all the way to very much smaller recognitions, such as membership in professional academies and so on and so forth. Of course, if you hit the jackpot and you're just right, then you get name recognition and fame through mass media, uh, both print and electronic, you know, depending on what you're talking about. You can end up in NPR or on Fox News, more likely NPR, I think. But, uh, <laughs> And um, for very few, you know, riches through successful startups, consulting contracts, uh, you know, bestseller books, and for a very few patents. Now, most of these institu institutions existed in very embryonic form already in the 17th century. If you look at the careers and the lives of these sort of great uh, scientists like people like Galileo and Newton, Leibniz, people like that, they all had very cushy patronage jobs. Some of them taught at universities, some of them had other kind of nice cushy jobs, but uh, that's the way they were rewarded for their uh, successes, and that's, and that's really what they uh, wanted. But compared to what we have today, this is puny, this is nothing, and you will understand that, okay? Uh, and what's more, of course, what happened to Galileo and to many other people at his time, in all fairness, it's, there's little likelihood that any intellectual, no matter how out of the box or how outrageous, will be persecuted for her or his views and dragged before court accused of heresy. Now, you may be prevented from giving a talk at some college and people may, may demonstrate you against you, and you know, we all read about those cases, but you know, compared to what they did to poor, say, Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake in 1600 uh, in Rome, uh, this is fa fairly mild stuff, I would say. So essentially, I think uh, this kind of freedom still exists in our world. But I add, and this is, we cannot take this for granted. This is something we have to protect day in, day out. And how open and competitive is the market for ideas today? And so, when all said and done, it is still true, also maybe less so than it was a year or two ago, that the international market for successful scientists and top quality personnel, including people who are likely to be innovators, um, is enormously competitive. And this is competitive in large part because the United States, because we have had a policy until not long ago 
in which we have an open door for foreign inventors and entrepreneurs. We have something called H1B visas, which is now being, being threatened. Uh, and I, you know, any, any attack on that strikes me as highly counterproductive. So here's some numbers I, I dug up, which you may find. So of the workers in computer and mathematical fields in Silicon Valley, 67% were born outside the United States. And immigrants have started more than half of the 87 so-called unicorns, which are startups that are valued at more than a million dollars. And this is according to the National Foundation for American Policy. Uh, and then if you just, casual empiricism, if you just go to any major research department in a leading university, uh, you know, the rosters are full of foreign names. In my department, which is made probably not unrepresentative, I would say something like two-thirds of the people have uh, names that are Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Israeli, Russian, Italian, and on and on. And this is the, the way this market works. You know, if their own country doesn't provide them with the right uh, environment, they will go somewhere else. And what's more, the world is still highly fragmented and competitive. And you know, this sounds bad, but it isn't. <laughs> because what you have to keep in mind is that this competition between nations in the market for ideas under the right circumstances, that is healthy and probably indispensable. And you know, just to give you one more example, it's not on my slides, but that all you will know, is 1957 and the Russians launching Sputnik. Now Sputnik was the best thing that ever happened to American science because it gave everybody a shock. Said, look at these Russians, you know, we're competing with them and they're ahead of us. Bang, you know, Eisenhower and then Kennedy put you know, zillions of dollars into research. And, you know, 12 years later, we have a man on the moon, but we have also lots of things that this science and technology has created for us. Now, had the Russians not launched Sputnik, you know, this might not have happened. Uh, now, I hasten to add, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Under the wrong circumstances, this kind of competition can turn into a nuclear arms race, into a tariff war, all kinds of other bad outcomes. You may remember August 1914. And, but under the right circumstances, this is what makes us productive and innovative. And oddly enough, this idea has been around for centuries. Here is a quote from a book you're all familiar, probably all familiar with. This is Gibbons' Rise and Fall. But it's still, toward the end, he has these thoughts about the world today. And of course, he's thinking in the back of his mind about why Rome failed. and. And, and fell. But he says, today, he says, Europe is now divided into 12 powerful, so unequal kingdoms. I don't know how that count is, doesn't match my count, but that's fine. Uh, three respectable commonwealths and a variety of smaller, so independent states. And then the, you know, his, his main point, and I'm gonna, not going to read the whole thing, you can read, the abuse of theory are restrained by the mutual influence of fear and shame. And republics have acquired order and stability. And then at the end, he says, this is kind of, kind of interesting, he says, in peace, he says, the progress of knowledge and industry is accelerated by the emulation, emulation is 18th century English for competition, basically, uh, by the emulation of so many active rivals. In war, the European forces are exercised by temperate and undecisive contests. Now, 1789 was a bad time to make that prediction, I'll tell you, you know, because it's you know, a few years before Napoleon, but how could he have known that? <laughs> Okay, so what does this model predict for today? Well, the world is more pluralistic and, competition, and competitive than ever. Globalization, which used to be the key word until a year ago or so, does not imply that competition between units has, been, has disappeared. Um, uh, I think of the world, and maybe this is still an outdated, by now an outdated view, it sort of consists of five or six major blocks, okay, there's North America, hopefully, <laughs> NAFTA, if that survives, uh, the EU, uh, China, India, maybe Russia, maybe one day we'll have Africa and the Middle East, but those will set up the major blocks that will be competing uh, with each other. Now, you can draw your own sort of list, but what is critical is that all participants realize that this is a competitive game and that they have to keep up with those other guys who are not like us. And so, or else they'll fall hopelessly behind in global competition. And so there everybody's concerned with their STEM education, their PISA scores. Uh, there's a big emphasis on intellectual property rights because this is sort of, and in a way I think that's a 
healthy competition until, unless it sort of degenerates into armed conflict, in which case, of course, what used to be healthy is now very unhealthy. What it also means, and I'm sure some people here will not be happy with me saying that, but I'll say it anyway. It is very difficult or impossible for any nation that is reluctant to adopt a particular technology for whatever reason to do so because all they will do is they'll drive it somewhere else, okay? So for instance, in Europe today, there is still what I think is an irrational resistance to genetically modified organisms uh, for a long time. And still, to some extent, we have a variety of limitations on uh, stem cell therapy and cloning research in the United States. Now, these uh, objections may well be justified, but they're going to be ineffective because if we don't do it, it's just going to go somewhere else. And if the Chinese won't do it, it will go to the Bahamas or the Congo. But, you know, we can't control the whole world. So this technology is going to move ahead whether we uh, like it or not. So no single polity can suppress innovation. And it's interesting to know that China, which had been opposed to the genetically modified research for a long time, uh, has recently done an about face on it. And so basically I could say this, as long as scientific and, te and technological progress are happening somewhere in the world, um, these policy may, be, uh, may not matter uh, all that much. The difference between the past and the present is not so much that this wasn't true in the past, but the speed at which things are happening. So in the past, if something was invented in, in Europe and the Japanese or the Chinese didn't like it, which of course was the case, it could take centuries until eventually it, it penetrated there. It did eventually, but it, it could take a very long time and it needed perhaps political revolutions. Now everything is instantaneous. And so in that regard, the conditions for rapid technological progress are better than ever. Now that said, again, you know, I'm gonna have to take a little bit back. Um, there are always threats to diffusion. Uh, in the 16th and 17th century, for instance, the Ottomans, uh, prohibited use of the printing press. And that basically is one of the main reasons why the Ottoman Empire and much of the Middle East that they controlled fell rapidly behind the West in this sort of technological race and of course eventually that became a political race. And today too, more and more countries have various limitations on the use of the internet. Sites are censored, sites are blocked. Uh, and so it's not all perfect today, but still it's better than it used to be. Let me say a few words about culture, you know, well, it's a humanities conference after all. Um, in the past, technological progress was supported by what I call an enlightenment culture. Uh, I want to f bring you to your attention a forthcoming book. It's, come, it's out in February 2018, I believe, by none else but Steven Pinker, called Enlightenment Now. I got a pre-print copy, and I'm in the middle of it. And basically, he makes very much the point I'm making here. And that is, what the Enlightenment meant, above all, is a belief in progress and a commitment to an agenda of research that is aimed at improving technolo uh, technology based on the best science available and thus improve our material existence, not just in giving us more money, but also in conquering disease and extending human life and essentially improving our daily existence on the material level, and that's really all we can say, uh, more than anybody else. Uh, um, and so what this program essentially says, and this sounds so banal to us, and it was so revolutionary when it was first enunciated by Francis Bacon and people at the time, is that the purpose of science when all said and done is to solve practical problems and not only to satisfy our curiosity, and or, as Bacon put it, illustrate the wisdom of the creator. So today, these beliefs are self-evident. I think the wisdom of the creator may have fallen a little bit on the, way, on the wayside, but certainly uh, making life better is still very much with it. So here's a shameless piece of self-advertising. Much of what I just said, it takes me 400 pages to say in this book. So if you're looking for a Christmas present for somebody, yeah. Uh... All right, now I'm gonna make one more point. And then I'm going to open this for a question. I've been going on too long. But I want to make one more point that's really important. There's something called focusing devices. And I want to explain a little bit what I mean by that. 
Society at each point of time has a tool, a set of tools by which they can do research, in which they try to tackle questions. But what questions will they pick? Who picks the questions? And so when the world, for one reason or another, poses society with a well-defined, well-delineated problem and say, this is something we got to fix now or else. That's when the best minds are engaging in trying to solve this problem. And that's, if they can, uh, they, will, they will solve. And so just to give you a little bit of a historical uh, 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 tidbit here. So if you look at the 18th century British Industrial Revolution, well, they faced five problems. Actually, there were more, but I picked five because they're sort of best known, okay? Of problems that they faced. And in 1700, if you go and look at the, what people are writing in 1700, this is what they're writing, they're writing about. They said, we need to solve these problems. Which problems? Here. How to pump water out of coal mines. Sounds trivial, but not a few <laughs> mine. <laughs> and that's basically where steam engines came from. How to spin high-quality cotton yarn inexpensively. That's the cotton revolution that we all learn about it when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. How to turn pig iron into wrought iron, one of the most revolutionary uh, techniques you know, that, 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 that was practiced this time. Something very different. How to fight smallpox. People were scared to death of smallpox. 18th century Britain, is, people, this is what people talk about. Not only because smallpox kills people, but it's, it, it, even if it doesn't kill you, you know, it leaves you pockmarked, and so people it goes through life full of scars. It's a dreadful thing. And finally, how to solve the problem of longitude uh, at sea. Again, <laughs> a very prosaic problem unless you're on a ship and the captain says, I know where we are latitude, but I don't know where we are as far as longitude is concerned. You don't want to be on that ship. Um, but it happened. And they basically put, you know, they promised a prize and said, if whoever solves this, you know, gets was 20,000 pounds, was an unimaginably large sum. Long story. Short story is this. By 1815, all those problems had been solved. That's what we call the Industrial Revolution. Now, needless to say, not every problem that society faces for you is always solved. No, they need to. <laughs> the 18th century engineers couldn't build submarines, and they couldn't yet tame electricity, or even, even cheap steel turned out to be they're, they're more difficult than they thought. But now let's look at the 20th century, and I can give you endless examples. Two of the most famous ones are the Haber-Bosch nitrogen fixing system, which basically allows you to extract nitrates from the atmosphere. And it was a big deal for Germany before World War I because they got their nitrates out of Chile, and you need nitrates to fight a war because <laughs> you need it for explosives, and the British Navy was going to cut them off. So how do you get nitrogen from the atmosphere? Turned out to be feasible, but not easy. It was cracked in 1912. Whether that was good or bad, I'm leaving <laughs> to think to you. The same is true, say, for something like Project Manhattan, right? So, you know, Roosevelt gets all these people in, uh, in one place and says, all right, here is the problem you're going to solve. And they solved it. Again, you like it, you don't, but that's, that's how things go. So that, I think, is the way to think about how technology advanced in the past. Now, people claim, sometimes claim, and Gordon's not the only one here, that of course they did, because these were easy problems, and this is low-hanging fruits. But I'm not totally sure that that's true for at the time. You know, it looks easy to us now that it's been solved, but it wasn't easy for them in their time. And I would think that the issue that we have today, like nuclear fusion, curing Alzheimer's, things that are really, really difficult. In 2200, some scientists may look at that and say, oh my God, how come it took them so long? It's so obvious how you do this, maybe. So here's my private list of the focusing devices of our own age. And you can make your own list, and this is very partial, and I just picked it off, you know, and, but it'll give you an idea. Number one, needless to say, we've all been thinking about it because this there was this meeting in Bonn, and you know, everybody saw. It's, of course, global warming and climate change. Uh, my sense is it's a problem caused by technology, and it can only be solved by technology. Uh, I would rather, rather it be solved by politics, but it don't look likely. And so um, te technology is probably the only way of doing it. The rest, most recent economist, I was just reading it on the plane coming over here, now it talks about how we actually have 
to develop techniques that extract uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reduce the amount of greenhouse gas because there's already too much in there. Uh, much less famous but equally nasty is ocean acidification, which is also the result of, 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 of uh, human activity, and it's sometimes referred to as global warming's evil, evil twin. As far as energy is concerned, of course, that's not unrelated to one and two, is the whole issue of uh, decarbonization. Um, so we have to produce energy in ways that don't involve you know, burning something, that's fossil fuel or wood, and so, needless to say, everybody's been talking about it, it's been making huge progress. I still am hoping somewhere deep in my heart that nuclear fusion one day will be possible. Unlike fission, it will produce no radioactive side uh, uh, by materials, and it will be clean, easy, and cheap. It's just hard to do. <laughs> All right, and then water. I mean, this is maybe less of an issue for... Most people in America, but if you live anywhere in the world, you'd worry about things like desertification and the scarce, growing scarcity of fresh water supply, and something called eutrophication, which is the result of runoffs of nitrates and, and, and fertilizer and pesticides as well into the rivers that then end up in the ocean and create an excessive amount of nutrients in the ocean, leading to algae bloom and all kinds of uh, disasters. Very different, but equally a focal point is antibiotics. We develop drug resistance. We've known this for a long time. And essentially, the word about antibiotics is not, boy, we got penicillin, we won. It is the Red Queen effect. To stay where you are, you have to keep it running. Because everything we throw at um, bacteria, Charles Darwin comes back to us and makes them evolve out of it. And this is never going to end, as long as the laws of evolution are true. Well, then, of course, very different is what I call mass customization, sometimes known as three-dimensional man manufacturing. I think we're basically into that age. Within 20 years, I think the entire way of we make most manufactured goods will be totally different. Um, and essentially buying anything off the rack in which it's a one-size-fits-all kind of, it will be completely disappear. If you want a pair of shoes, you should go to your computer and you punch in exactly the color and the size and everything else. And then you know, you produce it at home or somebody in some small workshop produces for you. Fish and seafood depletion, one of my favorite examples. I don't have time to talk about it. I've been going on too long already. Growing obesity and related diseases, a major issue. And, of course, as life expectancy increases, mental disease deterioration with age, uh, things you start worrying about when you're my age. And finally, and information security and overload, and this, of course, we, we, and we mean not only overload in the sense that you get a lot of spam, but cyber criminals and, and things of that matter, and how we deal with the whole world of uh, digital information, uh, which is still full of bugs. So I just gave you 10. Push me hard, I'll give you another 10. <laughs> Um, now, many of the problems that, that were on my list are the result of earlier technological advances that had some kind of unexpected side effects, right? Global warming is the unexpected side effect of people inventing uh, steam engines and similar things that used fossil fuel. And, of course, at the time that they built the first steam engines, who knew, you know, what this would do? And so there you go. But that can only be solved, and this will probably annoy somebody in this room, I hope it does, uh, by te further technological fixes. And these technological fixes, in their turn, will have more unexpected side effects, and so on and so on. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the untidy and circuitous path of technological progress. It isn't always pretty, and it's sometimes quite ugly, but the alternative is worse. So let me conclude and then open it for questions. The first thing I, think is I want to say, the digital age will be to the analog age but the Iron Age was to the Stone Age. It will be utterly, utterly different. And we can't even imagine what the post-digital age will look like any more than, say, Archimedes could have imagined CERN. So this sounds all very rosy. What could go wrong? So the problem, in my view, is not technology. It's certainly not science. I mean, we're doing great in this department. The problem is politics, or as an economist would say, institutions. Uh, here's a direct quote from the IMF, and this is, I pulled this again at random, 
You know, the biggest threat to the world economy is not technological stagnation, it's what they call, this is IMF speak, <laughs> political risk. And we all know what it is, right? And we all know who we're talking about. Rising protectionism, neo-nationalism, tribalism, no-nothingism, populism, obscurantism, technophobia, scientophobia. That, those are the dangers. So here is a quote I'm very much in love with. This is the understatement of the millennium, not of the century. This is from, this is the closing paragraphs of the future, uh, the future of an illusion. And what he says is, while mankind has made continual advances in its control over nature, and may be expected to make still greater ones, it is not possible to establish with certainty that a similar advance has been made in the management of human affairs. You're not kidding, Siegmund. And so, the most serious headwind then is not the national debt or aging or education or inequality, or says Gordon as other people contend, it's this. Against stupidity, the gods themselves contend in vain. Thank you. With all the technological innovations, how we deal with human relations, human relationships, the building of communities and so forth in ways that are meaningful for people that can integrate uh, and get them to use the technologies in appropriate ways. And some of the technologies you mentioned in the digital age were now finding out is maybe the new kind of warfare so that the developments in computational and use of you know, mega data and so forth is being used as a weapon. So how, how do we move in that direction? Because I don't know that science as we know it right now can address that. people build the first axes to cut wood, they discovered the same axe would also crack up somebody's skull. And so uh, this is nothing new under the sun. We are humans, and uh, that's our biggest weakness. And so, you know, it may well be that some people think it would be better if we all replaced us with robots, and robots wouldn't do this, but then you know, we wouldn't be able to actually, we wouldn't be there to observe. I do think that many of these situations, how you do it how you get uh, you know, be part of a society uh, is something that technology cannot really address. And this, I, but I do want to point out that even there, technological parameters set the <coughs> environment in which society operates. And I'll give you some examples to give you an idea. So one of the hallmarks of what we used to call modernization, sorry, one of the hallmarks of what we used to call modernization is urbanization. So people move from the countryside into cities. And community life in cities is very different than it is on the countryside. People live closer together, and in that sense, you know, they can see each other more often, maybe more often than they'd actually like to. And so what that does to community isn't, isn't totally clear. What has happened in the last 20 years to social interaction between people has been truly revolutionary because we have basically killed distance. Uh, we have created communities, virtual communities, you know, uh, chat rooms, all kinds of things, <clears throat> in which people feel that they belong together and are part of a group who may have never met one another and who may be living thousands of miles apart, but who share you know, an interest in this, that, or the other, who share a love for some game, some figure, some piece of music, you name it. And in the past, these people were always on their own. And now they can go and find somebody in Australia, you know, uh, with a love for Glazunov or something like that. And they say, oh my God, did you hear this piece by Glazunov? You know, he's, and, you know, that, that, that's, that's, a community, 
and so we're changing that. Now, whether that's an improvement or not, I don't know, nor do, am I, do I know whether the urbanization that we see happening in 19th century or 20th century West uh, was necessarily an improvement in, in the way communities uh, hung together. My suspicion is that they, you know, their pluses and their minuses, and they probably cancel each other out. But, um, but for better or for worse, this is what's going to happen. And what's, the only thing that gives me some solace is that people have had a fantastic ability to adapt to these new environments and find new ways of interacting with each other. Contrary to what Robert Putnam has been telling you, we're not bowling alone. Uh, nobody bowls alone. <laughs> well, he got that metaphor in the first place. But clearly today, we're sitting in front of our screens, okay, and we are emailing, you know, we're chatting. Yeah, I mean, some people are, of course, into Facebook, Twitter, ta -ta -ta -ta. I mean, these things keep changing all the time. But they have created a new way in which society interacts. And I must tell you, you know, this one anecdote in which, in which this actually happened to me last year. I was teaching a course, and there were two students sitting on a bench. I came out and sitting on a bench, and they're sitting there with their iPhones. And I knew them that be taking my look. I said, oh, what are you guys doing? Da, 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 da. It turned out, I'm not making this up, that they were sitting on a bench. They never exchanged a word. They were texting each other. And I go, hey, you? I mean, I said, this is a joke. Right? You guys are pulling my leg. He said, no, professor. We are texting. I said, why do you talk? Well, we're more used to this. And I go, is this the way we're going? Maybe this is the way we're going. It looks, you know, it looks weird and maybe unnatural to an old fogey like me. But then what I do does probably look weird to people who came before me. This is what technology does to us. We're changing, which, and the way the environment in which we operate keeps changing. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on that long, sorry. OK. Um, do we have time for another comment? OK. Um, I'm Lisa Newton of the University of Vermont. Uh, you, I want to pick up on what you said near the end, that as a matter of fact, a good many of our problems, those 10 problems you mentioned, are the results of successful addressing of previous problems. Uh, we try to save lives and we get an overpopulation problem. We try to uh, solve famine and we get obesity. And it goes on, the diseases and so forth. Uh, is it fair to say that we're in the future we're not going to be looking so much for solutions uh, as for balances be between over-medicating um, our diseases and under-medicating? Between saving lives and saving the pup and saving the environment. Well, it's a, you know it's, it's, it, that's that's an excellent question. I I don't quite know uh, to what extent this kind of balancing will take over. Uh, it's clear that in some technologies we have done done things we simply overdid it. Uh, you look at the use of the herbicides, pesticides fertilizer, things like that. And my God, it works, let's use more of it, you know? And then, oh my God, it works even better, even more. And then all of a sudden, you realize, oh my God, look at what we've done. I remember, you know, when I was a kid, you know, anything, and I favor my doctor, my mom calls the doctor, the doctor shows up, you know, he has a, you know, an, 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 an epidemic, epidemic needle in his hand, bang, I get a penicillin shot. Yep. Next day I'm at school. Well, penicillin died as a result because so we overdo it. We tend to overdo it, and we screw things up exactly that way. We did this with lots of things, and then uh, sometimes, you know, the costs of this cleaning up the technology uh, are larger than the benefit that they could ever convey to us. Think of asbestos construction or lead piping. I mean, we have screwed up big time. The problem with technology is. It's easier to see these things afterwards than in advance. You know, when asbestos was first discovered, it was a miracle uh, product uh, because, you know, it was fireproof and easy to manufacture and blah, blah, blah. I mean, who knew what it would do, okay? The same is true for, uh, this is one of my favorite examples, lead additives to gasoline invented by an American engineer called Thomas Midgley, who worked for General Motors in the 1920s, 1923, and basically, engines had this problem called NOx. So he said, oh my god, you put lead in the gasoline, solve the problem. Fantastic, 
Oh my God, all cars had lead four, five, four years later. Then they were on the two kids to, to get the damn lead out of there, and it's still with us. And so we, we, we do screw up. But you know, this is, the, that's why I said, technological change is always messy. It is always ugly. We screw things up. We deforest forests that we, that we need. We pollute waterways, lots of things. But you know, as I said, this is not something that's a matter we can decide upon. We can turn our backs to it. It's with us. This is who we are. This is what we are. And so we need wise policies. Everybody agrees upon that. Now, I think we, most of the people would agree what these wide policies would look like. But then the question is, can we implement them? Not just on a domestic level, which is hard enough, but on a global one. And there it gets, things get really hairy. So I'm not optimistic about this. I'm optimistic about the fact that many of the problems that you and I would agree are the result of technology uh, would have technological fixes. We can, given enough resources and the political will, to rip out every lead pipe in this country and replace it with something that doesn't have lead in it. In fact, this isn't even rocket science. This is easy. This is just a matter of money. But getting the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere probably will need, maybe not rocket science, but very good science. But this is the only way open to us. Because I don't think that what we can count on the world one day being taken over by what we call in economics a benevolent, omniscient dictator. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like an oxymoron if I've ever heard one, right? I mean, that is a really uh, uh, a pipe dream. No, we're not going to have a wise world government that will get us all to do the right thing. And so the next best thing is finding fixes. And these fixes, as I said, they will need to be fixed in their turn. So it goes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, but do robot armies scare you the way it scares me? Do what? Robot armies. No. Soldiers. No. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, they don't. I'm much more scared by human armies. <laughs> they scare me. I was in one. I fought in a war. Let me tell you, I'd rather fight, have robots fight robots then humans fight humans. Uh, they're easier to replace, you know? And they don't have mothers. I mean, no. In fact, I don't know if you may, there's a very, there's a great science fiction writer called Stanislav Lem, L-E-M, Polish, who has a whole set of books about these robotic wars in which he describes these wars. Nobody seems to care, you know, it's robots destroying robots. Um, it's kind of fun and it's, you know, it's, Probably expensive, but I would rather see that. I mean, I studied history here for, for you know, 50 years now. I know what war does to people. I, if we could replace people that have been fought by machines, it sounds like a capital idea. As long as, of course, don't have robot armies fighting people. Yeah, that's. But we went that's what I mean. Okay, but you know what? We always have machines fighting people. Ever, ever since. The Babylonians invented chariots in warfare. You know, there were always people with machines. You know, my machines are better than your machines. And that's why I win. You know, in that sense, Babylonian chariots weren't any different from Harry Truman's nuclear weapons, you know. And we fight wars with technology because it's hard to kill somebody with your bare hands. It's always been like that. And you know, we get better and better and, and, and better at it, which is byproduct of technology that we all realize. But if we were to arrive at a world in which we would have robots fighting robots and computers fighting, com fighting computers, you know, they could have nasty, I mean, I can imagine what a cyber war would look like. It would be pretty, we could lose power. We are, we are our ATM machines would be kicked out of um, You know, things could go, that, that, you know, that beats, you know, being in Dresden. Is what war really looks like. I'd rather have a robot.